we'll do a switch. There we are. That's it. You're live. Are we going? Yeah, you're live. All right. Hey, um, when the electronics are in a higgity biggity biggity boogity bop uh, today, and we're we've started again at eight minutes after. Oh my goodness! I <laughs> try not you, to be stressed. You don't need to have these on. Okay, and that is. Uh, yeah, my wife's been. Uh, tinkering with adjustments here this last 10 minutes and I am eight minutes and I'm realizing, you know, I'm never going to get this, this, these buttons stuff. I just study theology and, um, the, the modern world is, uh, oh my goodness. I think I'm in a cave or something. We have two people watching, whatever that means. <laughs> is it, is, yeah. is there really a second person watching? Well, there was. <laughs> and it, it means so, what it does. Yeah. Mean. You um, know what? Don't worry about it because I'm watching anyhow. you and you're looking good. Hey, we're just going to kick it off here today. Yes, and, and I'll, I'll explain my shirt to you. This is uh, after William Wallace was killed in 1307 AD. It took Robert the Bruce a little while to get his uh, head together and his commitments uh, solidified. And Scotland rallied against England. And I, I'm all I, I am. I have a lot of DNA UK, so I can say whatever I want about anybody over there, because I'm one of them. Um, and then in 1320, April 20th, the Scottish finally resolved with Robert the Bruce in charge, and they had a, the Treaty of Arbroath. As it was at the Arbroath Abbey. I was there last September, and they wrote this out: "For as long as a hundred of us remain alive." We shall never, on any condition, be subject to the lordship of the English. So I saw this and got this shirt, and they celebrated 700 years this spring, April 20th, just two months ago, April, May, June, July, three months ago. And of course, with this uh, scam pandemic, whatever, um, they had to cancel the uh, celebration and it was really really too bad 700 years in the making and it was turned off hello christy and family good to see you guys you oh, know drake that can we hit a wave here uh, yeah you can wave sure you can yay what do you know i did something electronic i, I just tapped so, the wave let me wave to my wife here who's right here <laughs> do we proceed yes but i wanted to say because that t-shirt is uh backwards for everybody is it, it yeah yeah it's backwards can you see that? oh oh it, it looks like elvish it, it does look like <laughs> elvish okay as long as a hundred of us remain alive we on we shall yeah well, don't worry oh, no, about it. That's okay. You're, you're okay. fine. Okay. You're, you read it out loud, which yeah. is good. Good job. Happy Hayes. We're good gonna, reading. We're going to cruise right in. What, honey? Uh, the other thing I was going to say was... My wife has keep, something to say here. Uh, yes, is that uh, please take a moment today and go to the YouTube channel, Drake's YouTube channel, and subscribe. What is Drake's YouTube channel? Well, you have to go to... This is the way you find it, the easiest way. You go to YouTube, in the search bar, type, take a break with Drake. With spaces, like a sentence? Yes. Or jam, no, nope, no spaces. No, don't jam it together. Okay. Take a break with Drake, just like a sentence. And then you'll one of Drake's shows will come up, and you can go to his channel to subscribe. If you just type in Drake, it'll all be Drake the Rapper. <laughs> so that would be a good thing to do. And, and, and did you know Drake the Rapper used to date Serena Williams? Uh, hi, hi, and hi, I'm everybody. Drake, <laughs> and this is Serena. We're, we're the white ones, I guess. Um, yes, we are. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, if you would please go to YouTube today, subscribe. Everything is streaming there just fine. We, we started streaming there, and it worked out great. But for some reason, Facebook was getting the data but not releasing it. Uh, whatever that means. I don't, I don't know. know what's going on. I don't know. Anyhow. Anyway, so, so today is First Corinthians. First Corinthians. On Take a Break with Drake. Yes. We usually <laughs> title that up. We've had to switch devices twice. This morning, uh, we actually started this oh, close to 15 minutes ago, and uh, we're finally getting it. I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee. Short up now. I Wife's gonna coffee, be here's coffee minutes. right here. Oh, it's yours. It's your, it's your kind. No, nah, I don't care. <laughs> so, uh, well, much love to all of you. Really, it's good to have you. Sorry about the delay here. Um, again, we're on the road. We've been on the road for a week. A week now. Tina and Terry Alford. Wow. 
Oh, I love you guys. I love you guys. I miss you also. Terry, I... Oh, I so look back on playing Little League with you 45 years ago. You were... You were spooky good. <laughs> Tina, you're awesome. Wow. This is great. Hey, well, um, today in 1 Corinthians 11... Now, remember, Corinth was the most raucous, party-crazy, nuts. The, the church was called out of an horribly ungodly um, culture in Corinth. Ephesus was the most mature um, city, uh, church in the, New, in the New Testament era. Uh, Corinth was the craziest. Thessalonica was a good church. Iconium uh, where the Galatians are written to. Uh, good, uh, yeah, good church. Good church going on. Philippi, wonderful. The people of Colossae, they had an understanding of Christ that w would leave you shaking your heads and you're going, you guys really understand Jesus. A Jesus that they'd never met in person. It's really astounding. Luke understands Jesus. And we have no record of Luke ever meeting him. And this is a good thing about that. I'm going to get right into Corinthians quick here. But people would say, oh, I just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want the eyewitnesses account. I want Jesus up close. I don't really care about Paul because he's, he's, uh, you know, he's all over the place theologically. Well, watch your mouth there, dudes. Uh, Paul actually met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And the Holy Spirit was so close to Paul as he's out in the Arabian desert studying and he's traveling and he's in prison and he's being persecuted. His faith was never rattled. Paul actually, actually met Jesus. And Luke, Luke didn't. Luke didn't meet Jesus live. You know, he may have... On the on the way, yeah. Lisa, Elisa tells us we're still on YouTube, and something. There was another memo. My wife has stepped out of it. She's not reading all the screens, so. Oh, let me come and see. She'll be right back. Yeah, Lisa's telling us notes. Anyhow, well, love of love. Here we go. Um, in First Corinthians eleven, remember we talked about it, the conditions of the church in First Corinthians one through six. Seven is marriage. My notes are right here. I'm just walking right behind you. Eight, we talk about meat sacrifice to idols and what to make of that. The main thing is that you don't uh, devour each other. Whatever your rules are, whether you eat meat to idols or not, or whether you think tobacco is fine or alcohol is fine or going to the gun range is fine or pacifism is fine, whatever you do, don't chew each other alive. That's, that's the sinful thing. You know, if you think, if you know, I know some really sage Christians, C.S. Lewis smoked a pipe. But I guarantee you, C.S. Lewis never took a drag on his pipe, puff, 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 and <sighs> blew his smoke in somebody's face and said, I'm free in Christ to smoke a pipe if I want to. C.S. Lewis, I guarantee you, he never did that. He was a consummate gentleman. I, I interned with a heart surgeon. Eat this. I interned with a heart surgeon who took a class from C.S. Lewis. Uh, he told me this, and, and I almost started to weep. I said, what? You took a class from C.S. Lewis? I said, like, you know, I felt like the badger on Narnia. What was she like? <laughs> he says, he, I said, he says, C.S. Lewis was... He was like a farmer. It's like studying with a farmer. He'd walk in. He had a shabby coat. His hair was combed. Well, he'd combed it three days ago. Um, he had a pipe. C.S. Lewis was so lost in thought, he would put a lit pipe in his coat pocket and keep lecturing. And then his coat would start to burn. And then he would pat and put the fire out that was in his coat pocket and keep lecturing. Hardly <laughs> He said it was so strange. But the brilliance of the man. Anyhow, but but so so you know, see C.S. Lewis here. He's smoking a pipe, and I guarantee he never blew smoke in anybody's face. Um, if you're from an alcohol drinking family, and a lot of al uh, European families have that, people from the cities in America are more free with 
alcohol and wine with dinner what and i know some more rural people and baptists no it's the devil's brew just don't chew, don't chew each other alive okay that's uh in nine we have about the apostles in 10 we had about israel's history we better learn from it we're in 11 today first corinthians 11 and the issue is it's funny this is all the stuff about men and women in church christ is the head and he's the head of man man is the head of woman it doesn't imply in a hundred years that women don't have brains that's not ever said or implied or anything the feminists really think it does say that today it doesn't it's saying stay in a chain you know we're riding a horse someone's got to sit in front and it's it needs to be the man leading leading the way um so anyhow and he goes on about head coverings here in chapter 11 and this is where people you mean there's not a there's not a horse with two backs that you know side no there's not a horse with two backs <laughs> <laughs> you get on you can get on an elephant and get a big wide seat and sit side by side here goes that's, my wife that sounds crazy <laughs> so um it talks about the head coverings and i've heard people say see Proof that the New Testament's irrelevant. We uh, we don't even think about that. I was in a church in California in the 1980s, and there was a woman there who was raised in the Catholic tradition. Such a beautiful woman. She had such a concept of reverence. And when it was time to pray, she would take her shawl and put it up over her head because she thinks, I, I need to cover my head like the Bible says. I have a master's degree in New Testament interpretation, and I hope I don't throw anybody's head out, out the window here with this. Don't Please don't throw anybody's head yeah. out the window. But the issue with the head coverings, don't be distracted by the head coverings. My mentor 20 years ago told me, he said, Drake, don't get so distracted by people's words. Read what they're really saying. Where does their comment come from? If they're accusing you about something, I was a very successful pastor in the 90s, and our group was growing almost the fastest in the USA. And with all the adulation, the wonder, um, there also came criticism, and I didn't know how to handle the criticism. And he said, Drake, don't be distracted by the words. And I'm going to tread lightly here. Don't be distracted by the cultural issue here in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, the head coverings are signifying something else. When you had, you ever, my dad used to use that phrase, boy, he came to that guy with hat in hand. You know, when a guy takes his hat off, you know, a guy's out in the, in, the, in the sun, he's got his hat on, but when he comes inside, you know, come inside, the Marines take their hats off when they come inside. When you get around a woman, you take your hat off to show respect for her, um, yeah, how do you like that? Boy, <laughs> wife is, well, she put my, she oh, put backwards. my hat on backwards. Sorry. Sorry. So if I put this hat on, I mean, I put a hat on for the sun reasons. But when you come up to someone who you tremendously respect, you take your hat off and you, you hold it to, to just, to just, you show respect for them. When a woman wants in, take your hat off. Uh, when you're inside, take your hat off. Um, so it, it's just, it's, it's a sign of humility. Um, have you ever seen the old Rita Hayworth footage from the movies? That lady who had that hair, and she would take her hair and whip it back. And it was so alluring, so se sexy. It was so, <laughs> like, wow. I like how you said that, so tentatively, Drake. Yeah. Um, but it was meant to be seductive. Yeah, but when you throw your hair back like that at a woman, um, it's like, hey, baby. Paul is saying, ladies, don't you come into God's house playing sexy like that. Don't you pray playing sexy like that. You're not here for seduction. Put a hat on. Now, whatever humility means today, put a hat on. I was in high school when the Farrah Fawcett era was going in. Ladies worked their hair up into a lion's mane, even ladies that didn't have 
hair for that. They still would do it. And uh, from the front, they would woof it way out. And they had to push hair from the back. So it like it was like a, the girls with thinner hair had like a fan going on. And the back of their head looked like, oh, please, would you just... There's only one Farrah Fawcett. We don't need a bunch of them. Hello, Nina. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Brandon. <laughs> um, so anyhow, but this hair, this like, wow, this, oh, baby, bring it on. Uh, don't do that in church. You're in church. You're not trying to. So so basically the church, he's telling the church of Corinthians, stop those hair shampoo commercials. Yeah. Don't do the hair shampoo commercials. Don't, don't do that. That's, <laughs> are, you, are you trying to, you trying to catch a guy or are you trying to talk to God? Don't mix those two things. Um, men, we we marry women because, like, <laughs> I gotta have this lady. And that's part of following God, is learning to manage the life and the emotions and the needs of a female. There's discipleship in that. It's, it's fantastic. I'm a better Christian because I pay attention to what my wife needs. It helps me get out of myself, which is Christian. But the ladies, you know, you know, bring it on, baby. You come a long way, honey child. D d not in church. Not in church. This ain't the place to pick up chicks. I know people that go to church because the cleanest, most beautiful, self-respecting, healthy girls are at, are at... They're found in the churches. That's <laughs> That's just the way it is. And the Christian women of the world are the most beautiful women in the world. Yeah. I've been in 70 countries. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> They're just a glow in, in, their, in their face. They're not crimped by all the darkness. Um, but don't do the hit squad in church and do the, oh, yeah, the hair stuff. You know, like every time somebody makes an album cover with a lady, if she's got big hair, they put a fan on her and it all blows it out. And, okay, you, you don't want to... Put yourself on a yeah. album cover today and look like it's a photo from the early 1800s. You know, where everybody's just, you know, Grant Wood or whatever. That's not catchy. You're trying to sell an album. I get it. For guys, you wear a hat outside. You wear a hat for work. You wear a hat to keep the sun off. In west of the Mississippi, um, you know, cowboy hats, much wider brim. You needed to keep the sun off or you didn't survive. Remember that in uh, Back to the Future 3 where Michael J. Fox says, you can't, can't, you know, don't forget your hat. You can't survive without your hat. When Marty McFly is playing his old Irish relatives. Uh, that's, that's a line his, in there. His grandfather. Yeah, his grandfather. But east of the Mississippi, they had the smaller brim hats because they survived that. Um, hats are different in Scandinavia. Uh, whatever you do, you come into the house of God, you take your hat off. You're more vulnerable. You're more humble. But when you walk into the presence of God, remember the veil in the temple? Well, it's simulation of a veil on top of your head. Don't come into God and just say, hey, dude, yeah, you and I are tight, you know, we're really close, you know, hey, you do watch the cockiness when you walk into God's presence. It's different for men, and it's different for women. Women, I've watched this all my life, women and men come to God for different reasons. Yes, they do. And the world over, women convert faster than the men do, because they have an easier time with the concept of submission. These things are different here. Uh, women, um, put a hat on, and, and for guys, you've so, got this, you do, and the thing is, t it's telling men, it, women don't come in here and, and do seductive stuff. Men don't come into church and, and act all arrogant. You don't act arrogant in my presence. You know, uh, kids can become arrogant once they become teenagers. They can get a little thankless and smacky and stuff. It's just... Their mentality is changing from daddy, mommy, to, whoa, I'm going to be in charge of a household here someday. So they're starting to shift. And an arrogance can take over if you don't disciple them really well. God, Paul, is telling men when they come into the house for worship, don't you come in here arrogantly. 
Worship is the highest thing we do. We worship through singing. We worship through service. We worship through communion. Do it humbly. Comment, love? Uh, yeah, well, so I was you can ask, hear my wife. Go ahead. Yeah, so Loud enough, honey. I, I was going to ask because there's part of it, how much of this is truly implied is a physical thing and how much is a spiritual uh, more of a spiritual uh, instruction of how to do this from the inside out, if that makes any sense. I don't know how to answer that. It is completely spiritual. It is an issue where you... Um, is it like a physical... Uh, I mean, almost like baptism is a physical expression of an inward change. Is that yeah yeah the water the water doesn't save you you're just doing something mm -hmm. the, you know Christ is living water he does save us but you just do something to symbolize hey I have put away the old life and I'm washed clean and completely covered with Christ when you're underwater you're completely covered with water uh, it's touching every square centimeter of you and then you come out of that rise to newness of life. And uh, if it could be done in dirt to show a real resurrection, but that's super messy and dangerous. Uh, so we do it in water. Did, there was a guy who did that, Drake. He literally did uh, make a capsule and he went into the ground. At, at this is a missionary, a who, missionary yeah. who used to be in uh, Finland, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he started doing healing ministry. So the government said, hey, you're going to throw off our social medicine strata. So they deported him. And they bar him from coming back. So the last I heard, he was set up in Orlando. It's very interesting. Anyway, Hello, Kevin. Good I'll, to see you, Kevin. Yeah, sorry about that. We're going to wave to Kevin here. But the whole thing about... <laughs> We're um, going to wave to Nina. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to wave to everybody. That's Yeah, okay. so, so anyhow, the, men don't come into worship arrogantly. Women don't come into worship with mixed motives. Be solely focused on Jesus when you're worshiping Jesus. Um I like that. We go into the Lord's Supper here. We have the Lord's Supper in the Gospels, and then it's explained further in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, and here's why they had to do it. You may not have known this, but you're going to know it now, and I think this is very fascinating. Remember, remember in the, I just laugh about this stuff. In Corinth, they're competing about everything. I told you about the guys in our church growing up. They they squabble, compete, joust, and joke about who had a Chevy, who had a Ford, who had a Dodge Ram pickup. Because you had a pickup in my valley, or you didn't get your work done. So, well, we'll Ford this, we'll Chevy that, we'll Ram them. Blah, 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 blah. It was all funny because it didn't matter. Um, these Corinthians are squabbling about, well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Jesus. Oh, really? You follow Jesus? The ultimate, really? Nothing about him has been written down yet. Jesus is gone. Paul explains Jesus to you. Apollos and Peter explain it to you. Oh, well, I follow Peter then. And if there's anything to argue about, they could argue about it. Um, it it's, it's just... It's crazy. I'm not going to mention the race of people, but I've seen this plaque about the certain race of people. They're in Europe. And it says, then there were the so-and-so people. Uh, or all the Perizzites, yeah. right? Or the Amalekites. They're all, they yeah. all call themselves after the Moabites, after Moab. Or yeah. The Ammonites, after Ammon. And the joke about this race of people in mm -hmm. Europe is they never knew what they wanted, but they were willing to fight for it anyway. <laughs> You know, it's That's just like, really like, come on. So the Corinthians are like this. And they're arguing about who they follow. And then we come to communion table and they're arguing about that. Like, God, ah, people. So it was the Last Supper. Remember the Last Supper? Um, I, I, I was so, in, I eat very slowly. He does. And we were taken to three dinners last weekend, three meals last weekend by people who were so gracious to us. I just love these people. And dinner the first night was three hours long. Dinner the second night was four hours long. Course after curse, course slowly came and we just nibbled and oh my goodness and layers and then this came with that and then that was taken away and then the silverware was changed and new plates were... Four hour dinner! The final morning... Um, of this event, it was a three-day event, we had a four-hour long 
breakfast. Have you ever had breakfast that went four hours? 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. I would say for the most part, except for maybe this, you know, time of quarantine accepting, you know, we, people are like uh, grab, growl, and go. Yeah, grab, growl, and go. I call them 5G meals where people aren't very grateful for the, you know, the food is put in front of them. First they gaze at it. Then they grunt. Mm. Yeah, right before an animal starts gobbling. Then they gobble. Then they're so full so fast they groan. And then they go. Gaze, grunt, gobble, groan, and go. And that we've been, we've eaten like that. I, I remember in the 70s being told, you know, dinner time had been reduced to an eight-minute event in wow. America. That's terrible. I was told that at summer camp by a pastor. He says, guys, dinner time. Put your stupid stuff away. I've seen people eating dinner together, and everybody's on their phone at their own dinner table talking to nobody in the room. This is wrong. We had a three-hour dinner, a four-hour dinner, and then a four-hour breakfast. This last supper was a long event. <laughs> well, in Corinth, could they have a big, long event and act like Christians? No, they couldn't. They would compare who brought what to the potluck. Oh, you brought Bordelais simmered marinated ribs with Asiago sauce and, 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 and Bourgeonnais and Hollandaise. Oh, wow, what'd you bring? Oh, you brought peanut butter sandwiches oh well aren't you a little poor boy aren't they were squabbling about who brought what to the potluck these corinthians couldn't get along <laughs> about Beans anything again? so is christ the issue while well, they're comparing who brought what to the smorgasbord not to really. the church they're not thinking about christ they're going, oh, you, oh, you, oh, you, oh, fussy, fussy, foo-foo, you. And it's like comparing hats on Easter Sunday. Um, and and people, people think, hello, Denise. And people think, um, that, you know, well, who, who's got the best outfit here on Easter Sunday? Uh, people that come to church twice a year. It's so easy to get off course. So Paul said, all right, all right, just as you commemorate Christ in the meal, have a small piece of bread and have a small cup of, of the, the blood of Christ symbolized. Well, originally that, uh, I mean, was part of a bigger meal. Yeah, it was part of a bigger meal. You know, after the supper, he took the cup, the third cup, the cup of redemption. If you can ever do a Seder, find somebody in your town or in your area who can teach you the Seder. Wow, the significance of it. Going through history, re realizing the significance of it all. I've been to half a dozen seders in my life and done by Jewish people. My wife and I have led two seders. And people are, it's in springtime. It's in March or April. Uh, come autumn, the people that joined us for a seder, they're still talking about it. Seven, six months later. Wow, that was so rich. Do a seder if you can. It's the Jewish celebration of Passover. But since you are feasting at this thing, you're turning it into a contest. You're turning it into an eating contest. It's turning into a food orgy. You're stratifying who's rich and who brought what, who has the nicest outfit. Some of you are getting bombed. There were people, after supper, they took the cup of wine and, well, there were some people that were like, well, let me have the third one before we get started. Some people were snockered, smack-faced, or whatever drunk skull. They were at the communion, celebrating the Last Supper, and they were tipping and falling over and telling raspy jokes because they were drunk. This is going on at the communion in Corinth. And Paul is going, yeah, <laughs> you people! <laughs> He's like, guys, come on! Keep it on Jesus. I, Corinth had trouble doing that. And uh, it's, it's hope for towns in the Wild West. You can still have a good Christian experience in a wild town, but you just got to do And reading Corinthians helps bring it back. That's why I'm spending, I, I think I'm on my fourth day doing Corinthians here. So Paul is just saying, you stop can take it. You four days. And let me tell you something about a couple of issues about communion before we close. Uh, we've switched devices. I don't even know how long I've been on here. Uh, 
Uh, we started at that, 7.08. Uh, let me go check the time. 7.38. Check the time. If you can set a timer for 7.30 to stop. Well, well it's 7.37. Oh, boy. Final minute here. Well, that's all right. With communion. Um, communion also solves another silly argument in our culture. What's that? Um, Americans are always thinking pragmatism now. Now, now, la, 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 live for, live for what? Live for when? Live for today. What is, what is that? Is that a song? Yeah, that's a song from my childhood. Live for today. Yeah, really? yeah. Forget about tradition. Forget well, I, about the past. Forget about, that who cares about the future? Americans are very pregnant. They live for now. The English live for tradition. Faith of our fathers live. You know, the people that believed what they believed in the past, we need to believe the same thing. And we look to tradition for our anchor. Americans think for what's now. The French think for the future. What's the last line of Les Miserables? The life about to start when tomorrow comes. Tomorrow comes. Tomorrow Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Hmm. The French are always looking forward. The fr English and so are always looking. so is the orphan Annie. And orphan Annie is, uh, you know, <laughs> some come out tomorrow. tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. And I like the way C.S. Lewis says, worshiping the future is a truncated faith. Look up that word, truncated. You're inventing something that doesn't really exist now. So what is the issue? Pragmatism, tradition, or the future? What should you do? Listen to this that Jesus says. Ooh, here we go. Do this. Pragmatism. As often as you do this, future. You're going to do this in the future. In remembrance of me. Tradition, the past. Ooh. Do this. As often as you do this. In remembrance of me. Nothing ties together the present, tradition, and the future as Jesus' words right here. Communion, worship, is the highest thing we do on this earth. Men don't come in here arrogantly. Ladies don't come in here with seduction on your mind or mixed motives. Do this with Christ in mind, not competition. That's what Paul is saying in... in... 1 Corinthians 11. I don't know if you've ever put this together like this, but this is ultimate reality. If you could sit down across the table and have a meal with Jesus, would you? Who would you like to dine with? Jesus would be fun to have for, over for dinner. Jesus says, oh, I would like to dine with you. Oh, would I like to dine with you. My heart changed this last weekend when I had two four-hour-long meals. And we shared our souls with each other, and I was touched. Oh, my goodness. I'll end with this. And when you take communion, look inward. Is there something you need to deal with? Is there something you need to put in the trash and quit saving on the kitchen counter? Is there trash that you need to take out and get it out of your house? You know, getting out trash, compost, coffee grounds, spilled, the, keeping the place clean, we got to do the same thing with the heart. At communion, you do that. I knew someone who came to communion, and I served them communion 32 years ago. Hmm. And they came to me after the service, and they and uh, this person was kind of off or something. I didn't know what it was. My spirit went, what? Yeah, I just served you communion, the cup of Christ. And they came to me afterward, and they said, oh, thank you very much. That was very conscience raising. Hmm? Conscience raising. That's a new age term. This lady visited our church and took communion, and she was a witch. Uh-oh. I served communion to a witch. But you didn't know in a church. whether I, or not she was. Like my wife said, I didn't know. I didn't know. That's kind of an extreme illustration, but check your heart before you take communion. Mm -hmm. You've got to do this. We will continue in 1 Corinthians 12 about spiritual gifts and the body of Christ. We'll get to Corinthians 13 
as soon as we do, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to explain to you things about 1 Corinthians 13 that you've never even thought of before. I, oh, I'm so excited. I can't, we'll get to that right away. So the Lord bless you and keep you. Wifey's here. da 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 Wifey's here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to make sure you end this properly. <laughs> the joy of my days. Okay, bless you. Love from our house to yours.